Okay, I have two o'clock. So hello and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium and this session, Facilitator Training Parent Workshop on Early Reading Skills. My name is Nicole Kopko and I am joined by my colleague, Melissa Klug. We are excited to facilitate this session for everyone. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping items to attend to. First and foremost, you can access the presenter handouts for this session, the presenter bio, and the conference schedule on the patent website, and the link is provided by Melissa in the chat. Just as a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which in includes a 15-minute question and answer period. To access closed captioning, please click on the icon CC Live Transcript on the Zoom control pa panel at the bottom of your screen. If you experience technology difficulties, please go to the technical support guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. As this is a Zoom, please keep your video feature off and stay muted to eliminate any potential distractions during the presentation portion of our session. We would love for you to tweet out or share out on social media all that you are learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag, which Melissa put in the chat, is hashtag patent lit 2022. And now we would like to introduce you to Lori Severino. Severino. <laughs> okay. And Nicole Kingsland. Welcome. Thank you. So thank you to everybody and welcome. Uh, we are here to do facilitator training for um, an early literacy, early reading skills parent workshop. So some of you may be parents here, some of you may be um, teachers or administrators in districts. And so this is, while we're gonna present the workshop, how we would normally do it with parents, we're also gonna be adding in saying, you know, as a facilitator, you might do this or you might do that. So it's kind of a combination of those two things. But um, so we're so glad you've joined us. And I am Lori Severino and I'm from Drexel University. And I'm joined by Nicole Kingsland from um, AIM Academy. And we are gonna be presenting this virtually. This can be done in person or virtual. And um, we do want this to be interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to either unmute partway through, or if you wanna put something in the chat for us to address as we're going through it, we're happy to answer those questions since we are in a training mode. Okay, so let's see who's with us. So can you, if you would start putting in the chat, whether you're a teacher or an administrator, or maybe you're a parent or something else, please just um, add your name and um, your role in the chat, please. Right, I'm the reading specialist. <laughs> so this is something that you could use as a reading specialist if you do um, something when you go back to school in the fall, if you wanna use this as a parent night um, to give them some information, it's great to do that. All right, so you should also have received or in the chat, if you would just reshare the link to some, um, Actually, the slideshow, there is a workbook that, um, or handouts that can be printed out to do if you're doing an in-person workshop. And then there's also the parent guide to early reading skills that we'll, we will be um, referencing back and forth. I do believe they were also in the session handouts. So you can see those there. Okay. So um, Philadelphia, I'm not, not sure where everybody's from, but Philadelphia is a unique city that has several organizations, including the School District of Philadelphia. Just we have charter a few schools. minutes ago. We have charter schools, parochial schools, universities, nonprofits, and city governments that all came together 
to create this read by fourth grade campaign. Um, and so with that, all those organizations coming together, the research is clear that a good connection between the classroom and home is what really helps kids learn to read. And what we share with the parents is that between the parents and the caregivers and the school, um, we can all make a difference together. Read by Fourth also has um, reading promises that they have started in the whole city. And so a couple of years ago, a parent advisory committee, the family engagement group, neighborhood councils, reading captains, and partnership networks work together to develop these five reading promises. And so you can see them here, um, ways that they're connecting across the city of Philadelphia to have kids engaged in reading with the adults in their world um, and different ways that they can go about doing that. You can see those here, talk it up, take turns, tune in, um, make school attendance a priority, share your family culture, language and stories and stay informed and um, make sure that all kids learn to read and learn to read well. So you can always check out their, their website. There's a lot of great resources um, on the um, readingpromise.org website. So be sure to check that out. Okay, so in this workshop today, we're going to talk about the skills that every child is learning, hopefully, in his or her classroom. These are skills necessary for becoming a strong reader. So we know strong readers need to know how to read, decode words on the page. And there are three specific skills that make reading or decoding possible. One is hearing the sounds in the words, and we call that phonological awareness. Next is matching the sounds with the letters that represent them, and we call that phonics. And then the third component, reading smoothly, which we call fluency. Take a look at this guide sheet, which is called the Parent Guide to Early Reading Skills. This is a Read by Fourth resource. See the Read by Fourth logos listed there. So it was developed by Read by Fourth partners, including AIM Institute for Learning and Research, where I'm coming from, and Drexel University School of Education. I wanna quickly review how the guide sheet is organized. So notice first that there's a color scheme for each grade level. On the first page, you can see that kindergarten's green, grade one is yellow, and then on the back of the handout, you see grade two is pink, grade three is dark yellow. Next, you'll see skills listed for each grade level. So in kindergarten and first grade, Students are learning about sounds, and I called that phonological awareness, then letters and words, which are going to be referred to as phonics. Then moving forward in grades two and three, st students are learning more about letters and words. And then finally, in all grades K to three, we're learning to read smoothly or automatically called reading fluency. So we suggest that you keep the guide sheet on hand during our workshop. During our workshop, and notice how each animation or activity relates to one of the grade level skills that are listed there. Finally, don't worry about what all the terms on the guide sheet mean right now. We're gonna explore together. We'll explain everything as we move through the workshop and, and give you time to experience a variety of skills through suggested games and activities that can be used with the child anywhere, at home, on the bus, in the grocery store, even walking down the street. This is another workshop that's been developed by Read by Fourth um, for essential early and foundational reading skills. It's important to remember that we want our children to love reading. So not just focusing on the skills they need, but also that feeling of what it's like to read with an adult. It's about understanding and learning new things and sharing stories and pictures. And we want them to be able to comprehend also when they move into reading on their own and um, we want them to be able to understand what they're reading. So this is another workshop that Read by Fourth offers. So you can always reach out to the Read by Fourth office to find out how you might also um, offer this workshop. I do want to say that although Nicole and I are presenting this as if you know um, we are doing the workshop, there is a script for every single one of these slides. 
It's in those, um, it's actually with the slides, so you'll see it there. So if you happen to be the one presenting this workshop, everything is already laid out for you. And the hard information that if you're not an expert in this area of phonological awareness or phonics, we have videos embedded into the um, slides so that the information is, is done through that rather than you having to know everything about it. So even if you're a parent and wanna give this workshop to other parents, that's certainly a possibility. So as Lori shared, um, the entire presentation is quite lengthy. It's, it's what's shared on the screen for the agenda. The three skills, phonological awareness and fluency are all included. We're gonna get to what we can today, which is likely phonological awareness and the beginning components of phonics. We'll show a few short animated videos. We'll take time for questions and discussion. Um, we'll show you some of the activities that are within that um, resource for you to take home, use with the child. And then the more you use these activities, the more you'll be working on or building what students are learning in the classroom, building upon the teacher's work and supporting your child's reading progress. So it's good for you to be familiar with these skills, no matter your child's grade, because we, if we want to see our child um, gain a missed skill or you want to confirm it's time to move ahead, move them along, um, then, then this is all helpful to know the progression. So some skills might be a review for some children, while others will show you what to expect in the next grade level, the next classroom. So if your child's in second or third grade, but they're having difficulty with reading, then I like that the progression shows you might wanna look back at the skills from first grade or even kindergarten and see how the child's doing with those earlier skills or if the child's in kindergarten or first grade and they're doing quite well, it might be helpful to preview some of the skills that would be coming in the next grade. Any questions so far? Yes, we have one in the chat. Um, is this something that we could present parts of the presentation to families in small chunks throughout the year? Yeah, so that's a great question. We absolutely, you can do that. Um, and there are also YouTube videos of just the, um, the little clips of videos that we've done. So there are, you know, if you just wanna present certain pieces, you can break it up um, into those chunks. Maybe you just wanna spend one time on phonological awareness and then meet with them again and do phonics for kindergarten and first grade, and then maybe phonics for second and third grade. So yeah, you can um, break it up for, how you see fits best with your parent group. Is there a Spanish version? Nicole, do you know for sure? I feel like there's parent information in Spanish. And I know that sure. Oregon was looking at, um, the Decoding Dyslexia Oregon was looking at um, putting some of this in different languages. I'm not sure where we are with that. We can find out for you though. Any other questions? All right, so we're gonna talk first about phonological awareness and phonological awareness is all about sounds. It's just another way of saying your child can recognize and play with sounds of our spoken language. Some people think this is a skill is too easy and don't understand the connection to reading so they skip over it. But being aware of all the words in a sentence or all the sounds in words is important to your child learning to read. So here's a challenge. Let's see how tricky hearing and processing all the words and sounds in speech can be. But let me alert you to the fact that this will be challenging because it's not in English. Okay, so let's see if you can hear um, the sounds and how many words are in this. 我喜欢每个晚上睡觉以前跟孩子一起读书. This is where I like to usually see people's faces. <laughs> it just went. All right. So um, it, when it's not your language, you can get a better understanding of when you're starting to first learn. Oh, so somebody said 14 words. Okay. <laughs> so let's see if we can recognize the number of words in this sentence. I'm going to play it one more time. 
我喜欢每个晚上睡觉以前跟孩子一起读书。Does anybody recognize the language? You can type it in the chat. And we have a guess at fourteen words. Does anybody know what was saying? Chinese, yep, Mandarin. Okay. All right. Uh, the point of this exercise is to help you understand that the more you hear words and the more you play with their sounds, the easier it is to recognize and distinguish those words. So if I played it more times, and it, it's funny how the more often I do this workshop, the more I can hear the distinct words. When I first heard it, it just seemed like a big mumble.、Um, but if you hear it more slowly or in segments. And repeated some of the individual words. Soon you would be able to start to recognize those individual words in the sentence. This is similar to how your child becomes familiar with the words and sounds they hear spoken around them every day. Right. And I know that I know I know. Oh, here what it says is I like reading with my child every night before he goes to bed. So one, two, three, four. Thirteen. So Nicole, <laughs> pretty much on there with fourteen. Very good. Pretty good. <sighs> All right. So one way we can have students or children play with sounds and learn how sounds work within words is through rhyming task. So words that rhyme sound the same at the end. So following along with the pictures, words that rhyme like dime, lime, time. So we're going to share a brief animated video showing a mother and a child playing with rhyming words at home. Let's play with words. Sometimes words sound alike at the end of the word. They rhyme. Here are some words that rhyme: hat, bat, cat, rat. Do you hear that those words sounded like at the very end of the word? Hat, bat, cat. They all sound the same. The same at the end of the word. They rhyme. How about cake and snake? Cake, snake, cake, snake. Yes, they sound alike at the end of the word. They rhyme too. Yes, good listening. How about rug and ball? I'll say it again: rug and ball. Rug and ball, rug and ball. No, they don't sound alike at the end of the word. Rug and ball don't rhyme. How about ball and call? Do ball and call? Sound the same at the end of the word. Yes, ball and call rhyme. That's easy. Okay, try this. How about bat and ball? Do bat and ball rhyme? Bat and ball. Yes, they rhyme. Oh, listen carefully. Bat and ball start with the same sound. B. But they don't sound alike at the end of the word, so they don't rhyme. Oh yeah, bat rhymes with cat, and ball rhymes with wall, but bat and ball just start with the same sound. I get it. Okay, now you make some of your own rhymes. What rhymes with mop? Oh, this is easy. Mop, stop, shop, hop. Good work. I have more. Hop, flop, glop. All right. So, did you notice that the mom first asked her son to recognize rhyming words, and then asked him to create rhymes? And that's the appropriate developmental sequence. It's easier for children to listen for and recognize rhymes than it is for them to come up with them on their own. So that just gives you some ideas of rhyming games that you can play with your child, 
And if you were to, to reference the um, guide sheet in kindergarten under the sounds section, we already talked about skills one and skills two, being able to hear a rhyme and then being able to produce a rhyme. So in the workshop, you would be asking parents to kind of look at that and see that's some of the things that they may be doing in kindergarten and we want them to be able to have mastered. Oops. Let's play with words. Sometimes words sound alike at the end of the word. They rhyme. Sorry. No problem. It's so uh, phonological awareness is a continuum and rhyming is just one component of phonological awareness skills that early literacy um, learners need to develop. We're going to explore another one now, which is syllables. So a syllable is a part or a chunk of a word. As an example, my name is Nicole. Nicole has two syllables, two chunks. Nicole, we can clap it out. Um, anyone want to quickly unmute and share their own name for us to chunk or clap out in the syllables? I'll go. Thank you. My name is Yvette. So we would say Yvette, or we could put our hand under our chin, Yvette. And when we feel our chin drop, we're feeling the syllables. Your, your mouth opens or your chin drops with each vowel sound in the word. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let's look at the animals. Again, back to pictures. So we could point to a picture and we could say, say the word. How many syllables do you hear? Modeling the first one for you, alligator, I hear four. Someone unmute and share for the next one. Pointing to this picture, how many syllables are in the word? One. Yes, we would say the word bear, bear, one syllable. And in the final picture, which we could say as monkey, someone clap out the syllables. Monkey. Thank you. We called it chimpanzee. We could say chimpanzee. So if your child's aware of syllables in a word, then they'll be on their way to developing the skills needed to read longer words. They'll be able to hear and recognize different parts of a full word. Now we're going to show another animated video of a mother and a child playing with syllables at the zoo because we want to show that you can do this anywhere. Here we are at the zoo. Let's identify some animals and count how many syllables are in their name. Oh, here is a panda bear. How about starting with the word panda? How many syllables in the word panda? Panda, panda, panda. Two chunks. Panda has two syllables. Super! Panda has two chunks or two syllables. Oh, look. There's a creepy looking bat. How about bat? How many syllables in the word bat? Bat, bat, bat is a small word. It is all one chunk. It is one syllable. Great job, you got it. Oh boy, there is an elephant. So, how many syllables in elephant? L -e -fin. Elephant has three syllables. You got this! I like the zoo. <coughs> and zoo has only <coughs> one syllable. All right, so again, you can refer parents back to the guide sheet. And syllables are addressed in grade one, skill number one, where it says, here are the number of syllables in a word. And in the guide sheet, when we were creating it, we really created it around, um, we were looking at the Philadelphia School District's 
um, curriculum, but we were also looking at the Common Core standards. So trying to incorporate all the things that they should be learning in those foundational skills in kindergarten, first, second, third grade. So now that we've talked about working with those larger units, rhyming words, breaking words into syllables, now we're going to talk about the most specific level or smallest level of phonological awareness which is the awareness of individual sounds within a word. So let's look at this next animated video. Identifying the beginning, middle, and ending sounds in words help your child to be a strong reader and a strong speller. Here are some ways to play with sounds with your child. Now, we're going to be sound detectives. We're going to listen for just the first sound in the word. Okay, are you ready? Hamburger. What sound does hamburger start with? Hamburger. The beginning sound is <gasps> Good detective work. Now you give me a word and I'll be the detective and find the first sound. Bike. 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 Bike begins with the b sound. Am I right? You sure are. Good job. Okay. That was such good detective work. How about we find the last sound in a word? I bet you can do that. Okay. What is the last sound in bed? Now you repeat it and hear the last sound. Bed. Bed. The last sound is D. Good. Here's another. What is the last sound in drum? Drum. Drum. The last sound is D. Drum begins with the sound D. But what is the ending sound in drum? What is the last sound you hear? I'll say it again. Drum. Oh, I hear it. The last sound is M. Drum ends with a M sound. Good work! Okay, now for really good detective work, we're going to find the sound in the middle of the word. So here's an example. And the word mop. I hear m, a, p. In the beginning, I hear m. At the end, I hear p. And in the middle, I hear a. I found it! Now you can be the detective. What is the sound in the middle of the word pig? P -i -g. The middle sound is I. Good detective work. Here's one more. What's the sound in the middle of the word gate? G -a -t. Gate. The middle sound is T is the sound at the end of the word. Listen carefully to hear the middle sound. G eight. What is the sound in the middle? Oh, I hear that. The middle sound is A. This is fun. Now I can find the first, middle, and last sounds in a word. So really important with that video is not just the demonstrations, but that it actually shows a developmental progression for teaching these skills. So the task was really identifying sounds, but the developmental progression of that is the position. So children are going to have the easiest time hearing and focusing on beginning sounds in words first. That's the easiest position to work with then the ending sounds, and then finally the most challenging position to identify would be um, that medial vowel position. 
So as students build their awareness for identifying sounds and words, they're also going to learn to blend or put all the sounds together. So where we were um, saying the individual sounds like p, a, g for pig, blending them together, or m, a, p for mop. So if you look on the guide sheet again, you'll see that identifying these phonemes or individual sounds um, are presented in this order for kindergarten. Sounds, which is skills number three, four, and five, which say first sound, last sound, and middle sound in that progression. And in first grade sounds, you see skill number three, put the sounds together to make a word like I just demonstrated. One point that really needs to be stressed when you're modeling this type of work with a learner is that you provide nice, clean, clipped sounds for your child, meaning it's easy for us to add on additional sounds to our letter sounds like the uh sound. If I was saying the sound for the letter P, the sound is P, but some of us may get into the habit of adding that uh on the sound, saying the sound for P is P. Huh. Instead of that nice crisp, P, just a push of air. So when you're talking about sounds with children, really be sure to keep those sounds crisp and clean without adding on extra sounds. Because if they went to blend a word like um, pit and they said pa it, pa it versus p it, it really complicates the reading of that word. So we want our sounds to be strictly really clean and crisp. Now in the family take-home workbook that's listed in the directions for the phonological awareness activities, you're gonna find different video links that can demonstrate how to pronounce the sounds of each word. Um, one is an app called the OG Card Deck. Once you download it, you can search any letter and it will provide a recording of the name of the letter and the sound it makes and a keyword that begins with that sound which is really helpful to check and practice our own pronunciations before doing this with a learner. The second is a web address for Jack Hartman Kids Music Channel. This is an entertaining music video where Jack Hartman sings the name of each letter, provides the sound and the keyword that begins with that sound. So children enjoy listening to this one. Mr. Hartman shows also how to sign each letter in sign language. Any questions at this point about phonological awareness or anything we've talked about before moving on? Okay, and feel free to ask questions as we go through. It's so totally fine. You can either put them in the chat or um, you can unmute and ask us. But um, we talked about there being, if you're doing this in person, um, you could do, there's a picture card deck that you can print out and have for the parents to actually work with there. Um, and there are suggestions for activities in the take-home workbook. So everything's kind of been done for you, for you to um, do this work. And I see there's a question, how does sounds work with a child who is nonverbal or non-speaking? That's an excellent question. Um, and I don't know the exact answer to that. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure um, as long as they're hearing, that will help to connect to their reading, um, even if they're nonverbal. So I think we would still want to model those um, activities. But if this, the child is nonverbal, they're not going to repeat them back. But I think just hearing it also and hearing sounds being broken down would later then transfer into being able to do those skills when they're reading. Nicole, I don't know if you have more information. To uh, add just there. one thing that stood out for me that some people use when working with uh, the sound level is um, something called sound boxes. And there are little chips that go with them. So even if I was modeling, listen to the sounds in cat, k, at, and the nonverbal learner was shifting a chip up into each box with each sound we would still be practicing the skills that lead to decoding proficiency. Yeah, that's actually an excellent activity. Those, and somebody put on the chat, Alkin in boxes. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. All right, so um, 
Normally, if you were doing this in person, you'd have about 30 minutes or about um, 10 to 15 minutes to share these table activities. And so you would just kind of judge your time. But if you've handed out the activities ahead of time, we're going to try some of them here online. So we are going to ask those of you that are very aware of Zoom and how to annotate and how to mark and how to um, do that. We're going to be doing some of that with our um, next activities. So we have a picture card deck. And then there are our activity suggestions. Um, and if you're in person, you could have parents pair up and they could practice with each other. Um, you can also pre present this virtually as we're doing now. We've done this many times virtually and um, parents and teachers alike like to get involved and do some of these activities also. Okay. So we are... Um, so those of you that are very familiar, I think we don't want to take time to show you how to do this, but I'm sure there's people on here that are that know how to do the annotate button. Um, and so when you're working with picture cards, I, we just want you to see that with the pictures in the take home packet, we also have on the back of the card, the name of what that picture is, because sometimes like if you look at the one that's a mug, um, some might think it's a cup. Right, so we wanna be sure that you know what these are because they have, there's rhyming things and you'd wanna know exactly what that picture is. So just know that in the take home packet, the names of the pictures are also on the back, okay? All right, so this is one of the activities and the first one we would do is identifying rhymes. And so you would um, show your child two cards from the deck and ask for the picture names and then ask the child if they rhyme. So um, if I circle, let me do my annotate button. <laughs> okay, if I circle uh, bug, bug, and I also circle mug. Yeah, so somebody's already, they, I like it, they're already on it. So if we would then ask the child, do those two things rhyme? Do bug and mug rhyme? Remember, that's that lower um, first level skill that they're going to try. And then you could go on and do other ones so that you could circle hop and rain. So you have ones that don't rhyme, and then you're asking the child if those rhyme. Okay. And then I'm going to just clear those. You could also name a picture card and ask your child to find the one that rhymes. So if I circle tree, can somebody circle something that rhymes with tree? Yep, excellent. Thank you for your participation. Oh, Kamala. <laughs> Somebody I know. All right. Um, and then you could continue doing that same exact thing with different picture pairs. And the next one is the more challenging activity. Remember, it is when we're asking them to um, pick a card from the deck um, and then ask them to find rhyming words. So maybe people could put this in the chat. So if I say, what words rhyme with rain? If you feel like I'm muting, you could give me some words that rhyme with rain, or you can put some in the chat. Stain, pain, excellent. So again, those three different activities um, are the progression of those rhyming skills. And then we can also move into um, those we've talked about the beginning sounds, the ending sounds, and the middle sounds. So when they're when you're ready to start working on that, you can use the same card deck. Okay. And so I can circle mug. And my question would be, um, can someone tell me the beginning sound of mug? And you can unmute because we need the sound, not the letter. Mm. Mm, excellent. And then can someone tell me the last sound they hear in mug? G. 
Yeah. So excellent. So we have m is the beginning sound, g is the ending sound. And then the trickiest one that they have the most trouble with is identifying that middle sound. Um, what is the middle sound we hear in mug? I think that uh, I just, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So just taking you through some activities, but you see if you were in person, you could really spend some time and, and have somebody be the parent, somebody be the child, and then they could switch and practice it the other way. Right. Okay, thanks for those demonstrations and for participating in the various phonological awareness activities. So just to review, phonological awareness is a child's ability to hear uh, units of sound. So um, rhyming, words, syllables, individual beginning, middle, or ending sounds. Now we're going to shift into phonics and connect sounds to the letters that represent them. So this is where the magic happens. Words are written in a code telling us what sound to make when we see a certain letter or groups of letters. And phonics is the instruction that helps students crack that code. So phonics is the beginning of reading instruction. It's very important for all young readers. The National Reading Panel looked at all parts of reading instruction and concluded that systematic phonics instruction produces significant benefits for students in kindergarten through sixth grade. Phonics enables students to read new words that they've never seen before. And in higher grades, when they're reading independently, they're going to encounter lots of new words, need to know how to attack and decode those. So let's see what it feels like to read or decode unfamiliar words. On the screen are examples of new words that you won't recognize, you've never heard before, but that you should be able to pronounce if you know the code. So please unmute and read this page for us. Can I have a volunteer? I'll read them. Thank you. Chot, fee, cloak, tade, therm, nimble. Exactly, perfect. So these six words are they each represent a different syllable type. Do you see that from the top left, closed underneath that silent E, then open syllable, R controlled vowels, vowel teams, and consonant LEs. So if you were facilitating this, we need to know how to produce all of these words, right? And the reason our volunteer was able to read these words is not because she'd seen them before or recognized them because they aren't real words. They're made up, they're nonsense words, but she has that knowledge of syllable types to be able to decode them. She has those phonic skills. So we don't know what chot or what tade means, but we can decode them because we know the pattern or the syllable type that's impacting the sounds those letters are representing. That's phonics. So when do children learn phonics? Well, phonics skills are primarily learned from kindergarten to grade three, which you see on your guide sheet. So the most basic part of phonics is being able to name each letter and make it sound. So we're going to take a look at this video of some examples of things that parents can try with their kids. A, B, C, D, E, F. Hey, do you know your ABCs? Well, do you know all of your ABCs? Yes, I do. I do. Okay, let's see. If I point to a letter, will you tell me the name of the letter and the sound of the letter? That is easy. Oh, yeah. M, and it makes the sound M. Milk starts with the M sound, and that's the letter M. Really good. Good. Now, here's another letter. That is a letter D, and it makes the D sound. Wow. Now, really fast. R, and it says R. E, and says E. 
B and it says B. Wow, great job. You really do know your letters and sounds. So again, we were trying to show with the different videos that you can do this anywhere. So thinking about when you're in the grocery store, you can still be working on these early literacy skills. And in the guide sheet under kindergarten, under letters and words, phonics section, this demonstrated skills one and five, which is recognize and name all the letters and say the sounds of each letter. So another phonics skill um, readers will need is to be able to write the letters, both uppercase capital letters, as well as lowercase letters. And we wanna link that to knowing the name of the letter, that production of the name to its sound. So we'll show another animated video here. Now, the magic is to write your letters since you know their names and their sound. When I make the sound of a letter, you tell me the name and then write the letter. And I want you to write the uppercase or capital letter and the lowercase letter. I know you can do it. Got your crayon? Yup, ready. Okay. What letter makes the sound of a? Ah? The sound is a, ah, and the letter is a. Okay, now write the letter a. That is a small a or a lowercase a, but what about the uppercase a that we use to start a sentence or for someone's name? Oh yeah, I forgot. Super! Okay, what letter makes the t sound? The sound is t and the letter is t. Now write the upper and lower case t. Now I'm only going to give you the letter name. You write the letter and give me its sound. The letter is F. And what sound does it make? <sighs> Great job. You are printing your letters so neatly. Let's try just one more. Now show me P. P makes a sound P. All right, so you see that you can play with letters and sounds just about anywhere too. You don't have to have paper or crayons or any kind of writing utensil with you even. If the student or child's having difficulty writing their letters, we can use um, our arm to make the letter. So if we stick our arm straight out, um, and move from our elbow joint, if I was saying, let's write the letter U, I'm moving um, and tracing or sky writing or whatever you'd call it, the letter um, that we're working with. And I could pair my letter and my sound uh, as I'm writing the letter U. Um, anyone have any other ideas about when or where you might practice writing or naming or producing letter sounds? We do have a question in the chat. Sure. Um, do we encourage parents to teach that some letters, oh, at the beach in the sand was somebody. That's a great that's idea. That is a great idea. Um, but let me just go back up. And it was asking about, do we tell, do we encourage parents to teach that some letters make multiple sounds like the short and the long vowel, maybe not going so in depth of the vowel pairs, but um, I think, my response to that would be um, as long as it's 
grade level appropriate, right? So if they're in kindergarten, um, if they're writing them, I don't know, but having them listen, sure, we're, they're gonna hear those sounds. Um, but as far as um, writing them down, I think it would just depend on where it comes in in their scope and sequence. So that can get a little tricky unless you're it's your school and you're doing the parent workshop, then I think you can bring in what's appropriate for um, the grade levels that you have in front of you with the parents. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Nicole. No, I agree with you, Lori, that it's all about a scope and sequence. I certainly wouldn't teach a learner that C makes the S sound if they haven't yet mastered that C makes the K sound. So we want them to know the most reliable or most frequent sounds first. And with mastery, if they know their letters and their sounds perfectly accurate, automatic, then we can certainly add in additional options for sounds. Sure. Um, some more suggestions for where to do this would be water and a paintbrush outside mm -hmm. on the sidewalk of the driveway. I think that's great. Um, and then also naming letters in the car, looking at billboards or at store buildings and signs. I think that's awesome. Great suggestions. Awesome. So just a reminder on your guide sheet, you're going to see that writing letters is under kindergarten letters and words, uh, phonics skill number two, which says write all capital and lowercase letters. So that's the expectation there, kindergarten. All right, so you've learned about the, we've been going over with the parents, the letters and their sounds. And actually we have only learned about the most common sounds represented by each letter. So that is response to that question. Also, there are other letter sound connections too, like when two consonants work together in a word. So we're gonna look at digraphs and blends here. I heard from your mother that you know the sound of each letter by itself, but sometimes two letters stick together and make one new sound. We call that a digraph. Do you know any digraphs? I sure do. My teacher taught us about those. When S and H are together, they don't say S and H. They say SH, like in ship. Great. I have the digraphs written on each of these pieces of paper. I am going to show you some pictures and you decide which digraph is in the word. Are you ready? That is a shirt and the digraph is sh. So it has the sh digraph. Super duper. How about this one? Hey, those words rhyme. Super and duper. That is a chair, and that starts with ch, a ch digraph. Here's another picture, and the digraph sound comes at the end of the word. That is a sk. The digraph is at the end. It is ck. What is this? That is a whistle, and it starts with wh. The digraph is wh. Let's try one more. What is this? That is a thumb, and it has a TH digraph. You are going to be able to read so many words. You know all your letters and their sounds, and you know your digraphs. How about blends? Do you know about blends? That's when two consonants come together and you still hear each of their sounds. My teacher taught us that too. When two consonants come together and the letters keep making two sounds, that is a blend. Okay, here are a few blends. Brr, and cr. I am going to show you some pictures and I want you to tell me what the blend is in the word and then put the picture under the correct blend. Can you do that? That's a broom, and the blend is br, because the B and the R keep making the same sounds. They just blend together. Hear it? Br. What about this one? That's easy, too. That is a star, and the blend is st. It goes under the S-T. Let's do one more. That is a crab, 
and it has CR at the beginning. CR is the blend. You did a great job finding the blends in the words. So these charts show some examples of digraphs. When two consonants come together, they make one new sound. So CH, WH, TH, SH, and CK, those are the most common, but there are other ones. And as you saw in the video, um, C and H don't say K, they come together and say CH. And then the blends, when two consonants come together, but they each keep their sound, like in BL for bull, SL and soul, GL and goal. These are not all of the digraphs and blends. These are just some examples. Um, but having children think about the difference between them making one sound or keeping their individual sounds is really important. Um, at this point, if you were doing in person or if you were on Zoom and could have small breakout rooms, you could have parents um, talk in turn about the difference between digraphs and blends and if they ever have conversations or hear those ter that terminology, because um, sometimes this is new terminology um, for folks and understanding that difference is something that's good to talk about. Are there any questions? I think we have time for um, maybe one more. I don't even think we're gonna get to the table activities. We can show them to you at least real quick, but a couple more slides and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, so we've been talking mostly about consonants so far. So we're gonna quickly shift to vowels. Vowels can be tricky for children, but they're so important. Every single word, in fact, every single syllable we speak has a vowel sound. Vowels are often, are always either short or long. Sometimes the vowel sound is short, like the first sound in apple, ah, edge, eh. Sometimes the vowel sounds long, which sounds like the letter name of that vowel. Um, it can be represented by a syllable pattern or a vowel team. So we have long A in gate, gate, I hear A, it's a vowel consonant E syllable, but in rain, I'm also hearing that same A sound, but it's a vowel team. Two letters are representing the vowel. So let's watch an animated video on short and long vowel sounds now. Let's read some words with all the letters and sounds we know. Here are some words. Cat, jet, pin, mop, plum, bath, frog, ship, duck. Very good. What kinds of vowel sounds are these? These are all short vowel sounds. Like at the beginning of these words, apple, egg, it, octopus, up. But sometimes vowels say their name in words. That's right. Then we say they have a long vowel sound. Let's read some words with long vowel sounds. Plate, boat, stone, bike, rain, peach, bee, Rake. Did you hear the long vowel sound in each of these words? I did. In all of these words, the vowels are saying their name. That's right, but there are patterns that we can notice here, like the silent E and the double vowels. Point to all the words with the double vowels and read them to me. Boat, rain, peach, and bee. So once children learn about short and long vowel sounds, then they can look at the patterns like the video showed. So think back to that initial slide where I had all of those nonsense words. One of the words was taid. It was a silent E on the end of that word. But if the word was just spelled T-A-D, what would it sound like? Tad. So it would have a short, long vowel sound. If I had the word kit, and I added a silent E on, I'm now learning that the vowel is gonna say its name and the word would be kite. Another vowel pattern children learn is when um, double vowels or vowel teams occur. These 
um, frequently, but not always make a long vowel sound. So we would teach the long vowel sound of them since that's more common first. So the double vowel nonsense word from that initial slide where we've read was floak. It was spelled F-L-O-A-K. So looking on our guide sheet, we know that these are talking about skills number three and four in kindergarten under phonics, and most of the skills three and four in first grade of phonics. So we're not gonna have time to do these activities, but again, they're in the take home packet and things that you can do. So if you were doing um, this part on phonics as a separate section, then you could do these activities. So there's letter card decks, picture card deck, and then there's a list of activities that you can do um, with each one. So just um, again, matching, you could do matching the lowercase and the uppercase, um, letters, you can give a sound and have them find the matching pairs for that sound. Um, you can go into um, choosing the ending sound, the beginning sound, the middle sound, and having them pull it. The better they get at um, even the spelling piece, you can have them spell the words. So there's a lot of, um, these are just some of the pieces. There's many, many, many um, pages to that whole handout. And as soon as I stop sharing, I'll show you again that parent take home packet that you have access to. And so you can see that it's a pretty thick packet. It also has sight word lists, um, the Dolch and Fry lists for kindergarten, for our first, second, third grade. Um, there are all these things that the parents can cut out. And then you can make extra copies for the parents to take home and they can actually um, do it with their child at home. So we've kind of done the activities, made the printouts for them and hopefully have everything there that you might need.